There's a greater anointing for the body of Christ today than there has ever been in the history of the church. Because God is an increasing God. More of himself, more of himself, and more of himself, more of himself, more of himself. All the witchcraft of Egypt found that out. After the third plague, they were done. And God kept right on pounding away. Crushed every single one of those gods and liberated the people, part of the Red Sea. You talk about a display of splendor and power. Mm, mm, mm. Open the windows of heaven. Pour out of the Holy Ghost waves of God's holy fire and revival. That means confrontation. I want you to go to 1 Kings. And I want you to go to chapter 18 in 1 Kings, and we'll start there. And the first one is the fire brings the rain. The fire brings the rain. The fire of God brings the rain of God, but you've got to be a platform for the fire of God in order to bring the rain of God. This is the delivering power of God. The nation had been encapsulated, had been captured by, by evil, and 850 false prophets had been ruling the land with a Jezebel and an Ahab. Every demonic spirit, every demonic power, sickness, disease, insanity, you name it had been ruling in the nation. When you bring witchcraft in, you got every devil that comes with it. And the nation had been under bondage to that vile spirit. And people's lives had been shaken to the core. And they were under it just like slaves to the powers of wickedness. But what's exciting is God said, I'm not done yet. All we need is one mighty radical demonstration of heaven to begin to turn everything around. So God dried up the nation. Dried it up to bring them back to a recognition. The reason why God does these things is to turn people's hearts. He'll use the very wickedness of man to turn men back to the righteousness of God. He'll work everything together. He knows how to use the wicked for the state of the righteous. And he had used the state of the wicked to hold back the heavens. So everyone had to begin crying out to God for a miracle, for a revival, for an awakening, for a hungering, for a thirsting of God. God brought the voice. God brought the prophet Elijah, and he, had, and he was able to stand before the king after three and a half years of holding back the ring. And it's always interesting because evil always wants to blame good for all the evil in the land. Have you ever noticed that? You are the haters. You are the dividers. You are the problem in America. All those that stand up for God is the reason why we need, we, need, we need to throw it all out. We need, they want liberal, vile spirit. And here that's been ruling. And now we got the man of God. And you are the body of Christ standing up right now, ready to be used in an anointing of heaven to face the spirit of the age. Verse 17, chapter 18. It happened when Ahab had seen Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Never get offended. Take it as a badge of honor when the left blames you for all the problems in the world. And the thing is, Elijah doesn't take that anyway. He just turns around and he says, It's not I who have been the problem, but you and your father's house, you and your wicked administration, you and the vile is pouring from you. All the things coming out of you, that is why this nation is in bondage today. We stand on the ground of the foundation that we need a miracle of God. And he turns right around and says, You are the reason why this nation is in the state that it is. But now it's a confrontation time. We need the rain of God, the refreshing of God. So first we got to get the fire of God back in the house of God. Somebody say yes and amen. amen. So the Bible says in verse 20, Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered everyone together and even invited the wicked prophets of Baal. Invited them all. Either God is bigger or he isn't. Bring them all to the same party. Bring them all, let's have a confrontation. We're not afraid of devil's church. We're not afraid. We know our God is bigger. When he shows up, they're going to have to bow their knees. So Elijah calls forth all the prophets. There's 850 of them that have been being used by a wicked administration to hold a nation in vile bondage. Crippling diseases of every kind. Like I said, insanity and brokenness were not the state of the nation what it was supposed to be. 
sacrificing of innocent children to God. All this needed to be confronted by a Holy Ghost outpouring. The Bible says, and he brought them all together. And they all came. He brought all the people together because now it's time for someone to make a decision. Who are you going to serve? The outpouring of God makes a distinction. Who are you going to serve? And he brings all the leaders and all the elders. He brings everyone together. And then all of the prophets of Baal, all of Ahab's prophets. And he puts a demand on the leaders. Who are you going to fear more? The things of God or the things of man? What are you willing to serve? God or man? And because there's no demonstration, they were cowards uh, up against the things of man. They were more afraid of here than they were here. Because they didn't have a revelation of the demonstration of God here. They needed something greater here. To overthrow all the wickedness here. The awakening of God is so mighty that hell suddenly is placed beneath your feet. And you recognize greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If we don't know that, that's where the compromise came from. Had them come together, brought all the prophets together. And he said, well, let's get a couple of bulls. Let's offer a sacrifice to God. And let's see what sacrifice God is going to honor. He allowed the prophets of Baal to get their first bull and they put it up there and they, so they cut that thing up and they built their altars and they worked all day and all night. It's amazing. God is not satisfied with the spirit of the world. You'll never get a Holy Ghost outpouring with the powers of sin in the middle of it. You got you to gotta drive everything out. You got to set up God's standards first. That's why there's no compromise for the standards of God in a nation. We cannot have a revival in a nation in any way, shape, or form unless the standards of God are once again held up as the highest thing. We need holiness. We need righteousness. We need purity. We need Isaiah's vision so mighty and so strong that we are shaken to the core so we see who God really is. So now we understand the power of sins and we walk away from every compromise. The church must walk away from every compromise. So they're doing all they can and they're doing their thing and you know the story. And they cried out all day and all night and they slashed themselves and cut themselves and made other fools of themselves. You know, you wouldn't know it until you put a demand on them to try to bring a demonstration of God. They've been hiding underneath their witchcraft until you suddenly got to pull them out and say, now, prove it. Prove it. And they're doing everything they can to prove what they know they can't. They don't have the power. It's all deception of demonic things. It's all deception and witchcraft. And they don't have it when they're called out to come forward because no one's been calling them out. But then the prophetic heart of Elijah calls them all out and says, now come on, prove it. Bring the fire of God. Bring the revelation that God is on your side. And they can't do it. As long as there's no challenge in the land, they'll never have to prove the lie that they've been pushing forward. They'll never have to expose it for what it is. So Elijah put a demand on them, prove it. And they went all day long, even into the evening. And Elijah said, that's about enough. You're all going to bleed to death. Been slashing yourselves with swords all day. Don't you kind of get the hint? You're guided and listening. So Elijah said, bring everybody to me. And he rebuilt an altar at the standard of God. Twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel, representing the standard of God, the holiness of God. And he rebuilt the altar of God. There must have been one up there somewhere. They probably had used eons before and had been broken down and busted. And God said, we're going to rebuild the altar of God. Somebody say the altar of God. Rebuild the standards of God. Rebuild the holiness of God. Get back to the power of the book. Do you understand? Do you understand that the Ten Commandments are the foundation on which you are supposed to build a nation on? That is the civil foundation for any nation to be built upon. That's why the nation is built upon the Ten Commandments. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the redemption of that nation, but the actual standards in order to establish law come from the outpour or come from the working of the Ten Commandments. The very, the very foundational principles in which you build any society on are right there. And Elijah begins to rebuild and begins to rebuild and puts all the standards where they belong. Puts the whole altar up in there. Carves up his sacrifices. God had told him to do it. Puts it up there. Said, but don't put any fire on it. Get me four big vases of water. The very thing that you need. The representation for every tribe, for every person. 
And he says, pour them all out across the sacrifice. He says, go do it again. And they go in that four more pots of water. Full of water. A commodity they were so desperately needing of. He says, pour it out again on the sacrifice. Saturate the sacrifice. The consecration, four more. Twelve pots, twelve tribes. The completion of God for that nation has been consecrated and dedicated. Poured it all out. I like when everybody's all in. Somebody say all in. We say all in. All in. All in. Then he steps back and only what God had told him to do is say, Lord, you have heard me and I know that I'm answering and I'm working according to your standard. Lord, now send the fire of God. And as he stood there, I'm talking about a clear, cloudless day and the fire of God must have appeared out of the very heavenlies of the heavens and it roared from glory all the way down into the earth because God said, I am pleased and I am satisfied. And the fire of God hit the complete sacrifice and the Bible says it licked up every bit of water. The sacrifice satisfied the heart of God because it was given with the right motive. It was given according to the standards. And justice and judgment tasted of the sacrifice and it was pleased and the fire of God consumed it declaring God is satisfied with the sacrifice, with the consecration, with the yielding, with the brokenness, bringing back the standards. God is consecrated by the fire and he has set it aside now that you are consecrated and accepted now God can send the rain hallelujah once the sacrifice has been accepted once your life has been surrendered God can send the rain once the nation comes back and yields everything and the church gets on its face before heaven Consecrate us and send the fire, consume the sacrifice, have our life so purified by your grace and your work. Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice on that cross, law and justice, lapped in every bit of the blood and they were satisfied. What an explosion the fire fell and God was satisfied. And you know what Elijah did? He went up on the top of the mountain. Somebody say to the top of the mountain. He went to the high place. You had the word about the high place for today. Thought that God had moved him on saying the high place. Getting in the upper room. And the high place is the upper room. And that's to begin to wait on God and 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 wait on God. Because you know that when you've done everything right, you have the right. Somebody say the right. Listen, when God is satisfied with the, with the submission and the obedience of the sacrifice of your life, when you have surrendered yourself completely to God, you have the right to get into the upper room and expect the outpouring of God for your life. You have every right to receive it. Don't just get consecrated. Get consecrated and then let the reign of God come down on your life. You have the right to expect what you yielded yourself for. That's why in nature we have the right. When we yield ourselves, we have the right to expect the revival fire of God to fall from heaven. They have no idea what could come in this nation. I don't care how many offices they hold. The Bible says when it sits in heaven laughs, I'll send my rain. I'll send my fire. I'll send revival. I'll burn from the innermost to the outermost. I'll confront every bit of sin. I'll bring the flow of God's division. I'll separate light from darkness. I'll separate holiness from wickedness. I'll expose every foundations of Satan's kingdom. And I'll put a demand on my people to choose. I don't all get excited. So glad I had the heart surgery. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Doctor said I was still a teenager compared to most. You know, so you're still a teenager, right? You were there. Still a teenager. You're still a teenager. Well then, well then, fix it. Put a clip on it. Fix it. <laughs> Did 
He gets up into the upper place. He gets up into the mountain. He gets up into the upper room alone with God. And he begins to wait on God and wait on God and wait on God and wait on God and wait on God until he gets the rain. Do not hold back for the move of revival. Do not shrink back from the waves of God. Go all the way with the consecration and the dedication and yielding until we get what we have every right to receive. God's word does not lie. If he says, I bring the fire, that means I'll bring the rain. The Bible said it didn't take long at all. The cloud began to form. And the rain began to fall. And the satisfaction of heaven began to sweep over the souls and the lives of the nation. And God revealed he still had 7,000 who had not bowed their knee. And he released the prophet under the rain and under the whole glory cloud of God to begin to move forward to the next level of what he had for nations, even the nations surrounding the nation. The fire brings the rain. Go to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. The prophetic brings the river. And that's power. The prophetic brings the river. This is everything is here is to exhort the body of Christ to come back to the Holy Ghost in power. Come back under the anointing in which you were called. Stay under the flow of the prophetic heart of heaven. What God knows and what God wants said and what God wants to declare. Speaking those things forth out of heaven. Things you do not know in the natural. Things that God wants to show you of his kingdom. And he wants you to release it and release it and release it. Thus saith the Lord, this is what I'm about to do. Now release it in faith. Speak to it because I'm about to do a move you've not seen before in this nation. And here he puts a demand on the prophet. He shows them the demise of the nation. Here they are. This is a prophet in a northern who is, who is in captivity, who is looking at the state of a nation which is in bondage. And God says, I am not done yet. I've heard people say we're supposed to give up on the younger generation. I've heard people say this generation is lost and we need to forget it. That's because they do not understand the prophetic power of God. They do not understand the outpouring flow of God. They do not understand that God is not done and he can break in. He can break into where our kids have been hijacked in schools all over this nation. And he can bring waves of revival that they never thought possible. They think they got the doors locked. Bam! God says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. I'll let you unlock those doors. I'm telling you, watch what it'll do to a young generation. For you and your kids and your sons and your sons' and daughters. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. <laughs> See that in a classroom one day. <laughs> They're preaching critical race theory and, and abortion and LGBTQ and all that other garbage. All of a sudden, a bunch of students start being filled with the Holy Ghost, right? Ah, you know what? You can do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Bring waves of God into these schools. We're going to put banners up. We're going to put little like types of banners up across in, in, in here. And we're going to have ways, things to pray for. We come into our prayer meetings and there'll be different levels. And, and one's going to be for this generation, for dry bones to come back to life. So when we come in here for our prayer time, we're going to set these up every time we come together. And they're going to be the specific things that we need to be praying for revival and miracle and breakthrough of God. And that's going to be one of those places from the north, south, east, and west. Bring forth the dry bones. Bring a generation back to God. If you don't pray, you don't get. If you don't ask, you don't receive. He told the prophet of God, chapter 37, he brought him out to the valley of dry bones. And he says, son of man, take a look. Somebody say, take a look. It's easy to turn your head so you don't have to see. You have to see that you're not responsible for what you never saw. How, how, how about if God says take a good look at the state? Without the anointing of God, people will fall short because they'll look at the state and they'll say it's over with. There was always a platform for a move of God. And I'm, and I'm fully convinced that heaven will hold hell back until we get a harvest in this nation. I know the darkest days are coming, but not now. It's not now. Now's the time for God to get his revival. Yeah. Now's the time for God. Let's tick off the radical left and all the haters of God by having a God move that has to hold them back until God says, I'm done with the work I'm going to do. So fight your faith. Fight 
all the way until God takes you home. Because until he does, there's a work to be done. And he puts a demand on the prophet. And he says, can these dry bones live? And the prophet is thrown. And he says, I don't know. And God says, when you prophesy to them, they will live. He said, prophesy Prophesy to the church. Prophesy, church. I've called a generation to be my own. I've called a generation to be anointed. I've called a generation to understand the flow of the fire of God. I've declared in my word that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Therefore, I declare that I will bring it to pass. Speak to a generation. Prophesy into the wind. Prophesy into the air. Declare over the schools. Declare over the generation. Thus says the Lord, I shall call you forth. I shall resurrect you. I shall bring your dead, dry bones to a place of life and purpose. I will bring you forth, says the Lord, because I've called you. I've called you. I've called you from the dawn of the morning. I've called you. I've called you. I've called you. Church, prophesy what God says. Declare what God said. I will have my harvest. I will have my harvest. I will fill my house. I will fill my boat. I will satisfy my heart with the flow of revival that I will pour. I will rescue a generation. Prophesy to that generation. Doesn't matter how they look. Prophesy to that generation. Put a demand. The more you speak to them, the more the devil's got to let go. You got to call them out from hell itself. You got to call them out from darkness. Call him out. And he said, and God said, prophesy. And he began to speak, bless the Lord. I know it's charismatic. But you know what? The world is going to hell. The devil seems to have all the power. And somehow the church is supposed to lay on its back castrated, sorry, and have no ounce of authority because it doesn't sit for a few dead boards and a few dead churches. People are going to hell and you complain about it and you whine about it, but you don't want to see the flow of God because that's just not good for you. And people's lives are being decimated and heaven is saying, let my people go. Let them move forward. Get out of the way and let royal glory begin to pour into that. Let my gifts back into the house. Let the Holy Ghost back into the house. Because if you don't, you're not going to be my house. Ezekiel 47, I'm almost done. You know, obviously a lot of that I do is just to stir, stir, stir you up. That's called exhort you. Go to Ezekiel 47. We know what happened. Everything shook, rattled, and rolled. Bones began to come together. Bones that were mostly gone, all the dust suddenly began to become bone. And then it began to become sinew and it began to become marrow. It's amazing. It's amazing. The very dust of the earth in which you were formed from began to be transformed by the prophetic word of God. It began to literally rebuild an entire army. Because remember, remember man that thou art dust and unto dust you, were, you shall return. But God took dust, a little bit of spit and breathed on it the breath of life. A little bit of God spit. That's where you came from. Handful of dirt, a little bit of spit, a little bit of breath of God, and here you are today. Bless God. Never thought of it that way, did you? I'm God spit? Hey, Holy Ghost God spit. Imagine God just said, he spit on a man's, spit made mud, put it on a man's eye. Okay, I can kind of roll with that. You understand? If he can spit in mud and bring healing, he is spitting a pile of dirt and create man. That's God's spit. Holy Ghost God's spit. Call the dry bones back to life. He did, verse chapter 47. And the Bible says, now it's time for the rivers of God to come forth. Rivers are the healing, delivering power of God. The rain brings the refreshing in the reviving of God because the fire of God brought the consecration and then we get the presence of God. Now we get the prophetic of God. We can get the river of God. We, can be, we begin to see the power of God in demonstration. Somebody say the power of God. Mountain moving power. It says that he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. But the front of the temple faced east, and the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. Now, we're seeing this in the spirit. 
and he's seeing the temple and, and the water's flowing up on the right side of the altar from the right, and there it's going and he's watching water and it's, and, it, and, it, and it's flowing. It doesn't look like much when it starts. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside, the outer gate that faces east. I know you're all confused by now. Out on the right side, when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubics and brought me into the water, and the water was up to my ankles. Huh. Water coming out from the temple from way over there, and he brings me out and has me stand there, and it's to my ankles. Hmm. I'm wet. Brings me to the thousand feet. Notice what it says. And now it's up to my knees. So my shorts are useless, just about. See, at my age, you wear shorts like this. And I was up to my knees. And then it brings him another thousand cubics out. And the water's to my waist. There's something here. It's an ever-increasing flow of the demonstration and the power of God. Then he brings him out another thousand cubits. And what he steps into is a river, vast and strong. A river that they can't cross. A river that they can't do it because it's so powerful. It's so strong. And he brings me through and he brings me to the other side. He says, and here's all the, all the life, all the trees and the leaves are for the healing of nations. This is a demonstration of tremendous power. This will, break the, this will break Satan's kingdom down and bring healing into people's lives. It is a revelation of the fire and the power of God. It's the strength of God. Last one, go to the book of Acts. Just what we need. Just what we need. Just what we need. Just what you need, chapter 2. You know, when you get into that book, you find out something that the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 38, says how Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's what he did. See, so oppressed covers every area of your life. He didn't just say healing all that were sick. He said all that were oppressed. So mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, that covers the entire gamut. All that were oppressed by Satan's kingdom. He went about liberating everything. Jesus healed everything. Somebody say everything. I mean, he didn't heal. I mean, he didn't bring you out just to leave you half broke. He brought you out to heal everything. That's the kind of God that he is. First John chapter 3 and verse 8 says how he how he came to undo everything the devil had done. So we have to understand that, that he's coming to Christ, the Holy Ghost, and that great waves of revival. He's coming to undo everything the devil has done against your life and begin to rebuild and restore and heal you. Just like the old dry bones, the prophetic of God, begin to rebuild and restore and restore and restore and restore. The fire of God that consecrates you and the rain of God that satisfies you. And now the outpouring of God that fills you. The day of Pentecost had fully come. The Bible says they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house. <clears throat> the beginning of the, of the great move of heaven. <clears throat> the beginning of the power church age. The beginning of your calling and your election. They were all together in one accord. God released out of heaven a mighty explosion of the glory of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And a glory that we saw in the river does not fade, but will increase and go from nation to nation and life to life in ever increasing and ever increasing and ever overflowing move of God. That's why you can never shut down the Holy Ghost because it's getting greater and greater. It's moving more and more and more. And the Bible said that was the very beginning of an ongoing flow of glory all the way to the day. <coughs> Stand your feet in the house. <clears throat> the power that you needed when you came in tonight, <clears throat> that flow that you needed by the presence of God, that touch that you had is because in God the touch is always there. <clears throat> we consecrate, we set a house apart for the visitation of God. We want the presence of God in the house. We can minister to you. 
that, that glow, that, that, that flow, that, the, the rain of God, the satisfier, the river of God to bring healing to you and the, and, the, and the outpouring power of God to fill you and satisfy you and anoint you with the power of heaven. Transforms everything about you. <clears throat> and you become a flame of fire in the hand of God. <clears throat> 